Ed Roberts welcoming you to TV Confidential, radio talk show about television. Now, welcome back our friend David Frankham in our second hour. David Frankham, the voice of Sergeant Tibbs in 101 Dalmatians, and an actor known to most of you for his appearances in such classic films and classic TV series as Master of the World, Return of the Fly, King Rat, the FBI, Maverick, Thriller, and the original Star Trek. David Franken will be appearing at the Traconderoga Weekend Gathering in New York next weekend. We'll tell you about that. Plus, we'll pass along the latest information about the DVD release of David's latest film, the stop-action puppet animation version of The House of the Seven Gables. David Franken will join us in our second hour. We hope you'll stay tuned for that. In the meantime, we'll open up our first hour by welcoming back Mr. Adam Sharp. Adam Sharp president of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, a.k.a. Natus, a.k.a. the Daytime Emmy Awards. One of the ceremonies under the wings of Natus is the News and Documentary Emmy Awards, which will be presented September 24th in New York City. We'll talk to Adam about the state of TV news in general. We'll also ask a few questions about Adam's career before the Emmys, which included six years as head of news, government, and elections, at Twitter, where Adam advised journalists, news organizations, candidates, and government organizations in more than 20 countries. But first, we began our conversation by telling Adam, last time you visited us, uh, you were interim president, you are now president president, so congratulations. Well, thank you. There's probably a better way to say this, but as we record this conversation, we're talking three days after the shootings in Dayton, and El Paso, both of which are stories that, I guess, underscore why television news will always be relevant, right? For sure. I mean, television news and documentary, through each of their own individual perspectives, add context to our everyday lives. They connect us to our communities. They connect us to the issues that drive our politics and affect our lives. And I think anyone who saw the coverage out of Texas and Ohio this week took it as an opportunity to reflect and think about some of these political issues in a more tangible way because the cameras were there and brought that intimacy of the event home for the viewers. And that speaks specifically to uh, the primary reason why Adam is with us tonight uh, because we're going to talk a little bit about the News and Documentary Emmy Awards, which will be presented Tuesday, September 24th in New York City. And it's not just the breaking news component of a live story such as the shootings in Dayton and El Paso, but it is the probing beyond what happened immediately, the trying to figure out what happened, why it happened, what's going on, uh, how we can make sense of it. And, well, I don't know whether this is most important, but to me it's just as important, how it affects the personal lives and communities of those affected. Exactly. And, and I think there the television journalists have multiple responsibilities. One is to be that gatherer of information to find out what happened and inform the, the broader public so that they can better understand the, the events. But then at the same time, it's the role of journalists to ask the questions of those in power that the community is asking. It is the job of the journalists to be in the White House briefing room or on Capitol Hill and say, okay, this has happened. What are you doing about it? And so the reporters, through their access to both the scene of these tragic events and those policymakers who have an influence over the, the law and, and the process for how we prevent and respond to these types of events. The role of the television journalist is to use that access to really be a conduit for the viewer and the uh, American sitting at home, taking it all in and reacting to it on one side of the, the issue or another. And that is a hard thing to do anyway, you know, with a lot of responsibility going on. And if you happen to be covering a story or a part of a story in real time, that makes it even doubly difficult. But going back to White House correspondence, it is especially 
challenging when you have an occupant who doesn't seem to understand that people like Jim Acosta are doing their job. No, I think that's that's absolutely true, and the President Trump is a bit of a paradox in in that regard. In that he probably had the greatest understanding for the television media of any political candidate of his generation. I think you'd have to go back to maybe Ronald Reagan for someone who had as much a command and understanding of the medium. Uh, certainly informed by his his years as the, the star of The Apprentice on NBC, but then at the same time to sort of rail against uh, the elements of, of the media who don't follow his script. Adam Sharp is on the line with us. Adam Sharp, president of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, also known as the Daytime Emmy Awards, the 40th Annual News and Documentary Emmy Awards will be presented Tuesday, September 24th at Lincoln Center in New York City. The 40th Annual News and Documentary Emmy Awards honors programming distributed during calendar year 2018. This year's Lifetime Achievement Award will be presented to longtime NBC News Affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell in recognition of her 50-year career covering domestic and international affairs. More information, emmyonline.tv. The other thing I was thinking about before I called you, Adam, is last week we had gavel-to-gavel coverage of Robert Mueller's testimony, and I was thinking particularly of the news coverage of a few weeks earlier when Mueller gave his five or ten minute speech and I remember I was doing two kinds of listening at the time on the one hand I'm listening to what Mueller was saying and I'm also listening to the journalists I was following it on NPR at the time but the team of journalists at NPR who are a reporting what Mueller is saying and b trying to assimilate and Uh, summarize all the details of the 400-page report in real time, that is terribly difficult to do, especially when you're sort of learning it on the fly. Mm -hmm. And and I think that you certainly saw in the reactions to Mueller's testimony some of the impact that the medium can have in how people digest the information. There was just as much talk about, shall we say, performance points as there was about the actual substance of the answers. For many people, he uh, (laughs) committed the the sin of uh, not being great on on TV uh, during parts of that testimony. But that is something that we've seen uh, all throughout the history of television. Certainly in the famous 1960 debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Those who watched on television strongly thought Kennedy had won. Those who listened on radio thought Nixon had won that debate. We saw that again in the Carter-Ford debates in 1976. And so certainly television does change the experience of these, these current events, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. It's not not perfect. It certainly adds this element of performance points into it. But then for telling the broader story that we're responding to, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find another medium that can uh, shed light on a story and deliver that story in in a digestible, intimate way better than television. You're kind of touching on what what I would call the blurring of the lines between news and entertainment once upon a time tv news was tv news tv entertainment was tv entertainment they were both separate things in the last 30 to 40 years that started to change and even though i would say most people who enter broadcast news television news try to do their jobs as journalists you cannot divorce yourself from the fact that it is a visual medium You have to be as compelling. You hope for a story to be as compelling as possible. Even silly things like, we won't name them, but there are cable networks that have clocks, you know, and they do like 60 minutes, 59 minutes, 30 seconds until the Mueller report, for example, you know, to try to build a sense of 
excitement to something that is it is a congressional hearing, which is not exactly a visually exciting thing. Sure. I mean, I think that right off the, the bat, with anything, you don't want to be that tree in the forest when no one's around. Yeah. Every one of the, the networks uh, and, and producers creating video content around the news are in this ever more competitive marketplace. And I think are each trying to grab that audience any way they can because the only way you can do that work of the journalism is if there's an audience for it. And I think when you look at, for example, the audience numbers for the three network evening newscasts, which together were appointment viewing for nearly every American, let's say, 40, 50 years ago, now they combined are are less than a typical top 10 primetime enter- entertainment show and and not even uh, where one of them would have been 40, 50 years ago. I think we were reminded in the recent coverage of the Apollo 11 landing, for example, what a pivotal and seminal place in society Walter Cronkite and the CBS Evening News held. And I'm not sure any single newscast holds that same mantle today. But I think you know, that the question of does it cross the line into to entertainment has many different shades. I think, by and large, that line is very carefully uh, respected. Sure, you have things like the countdown clocks trying to build anticipation and excitement. You have big lineups now, opinion programming and commentary and debate programming dominating prime time on the cable news networks anyway, so they're shifting into more of a televised version of uh, what talk radio started to do in the last, say, 20, 25 years. But then I think you've also seen things that were originally dismissed as bringing entertainment that wind up telling better stories. Yeah. You know, 60 Minutes, for example, now 50 plus years old, when it started, there were several who dismissed it because they were bringing these production standards of entertainment programming, more of a cinematic style to how they shot pieces, to news where people were much more used to that just straight shoot, bring it back, cut it, sort of quick and dirty approach to news material. Today, you know, in our nominations for the News and Documentary Emmys this year, Vice News Tonight on HBO was the most nominated newscast for the second year in a row. And I think part of that was because they have taken many of the stylistic points from online video and social media and the ability to shoot with a $1,000 DSLR camera what would have taken $100,000 a year a decade ago to bring a completely different texture to the evening newscast. And as a result, it, it winds up being some of the most compelling journalism out there. So I think bringing some of those techniques of entertainment don't necessarily get in the way of the journalism. I think it, it highlights it if applied appropriately. Yeah, and that goes back to the point you made earlier about the changing face of the primetime network newscasts on uh, CBS, ABC, and NBC, in that because times have changed, all three networks probably know that by the time they tune in at 7 o'clock you know, or 6 o'clock uh, local time to watch the NBC Evening News, for example, the main headline... Uh, Most viewers probably are aware of it, so what you do, or at least I would imagine what you do, is you focus beyond the immediate headline, and again, going back to what we said, try to provide some context as to what happened and why it's happening uh, within the confines of a 30-minute network newscast. Exactly. Adam Sharp is on the line with us. Adam Sharp is president of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, a.k.a. the Daytime Emmy Awards, the 40th Annual News and Documentary Emmy Awards will be presented on Tuesday, September 24th at Lincoln Center in New York City. CBS has the second most nominations with 32. PBS has the most with 47. HBO is tied with CBS for second place with 32. 
nominations. Netflix has six nominations. One of Netflix's nominations is for a documentary called Tricky Dick. And the Man in Black, about Johnny Cash's visit with Richard Nixon in the White House in April 1970. I bring up Netflix because a few minutes ago we talked about the Nixon-Kennedy debate and how that was sort of a seminal moment in television news. Adam, this is another fluke of the calendar, but we are recording this conversation two days before the 45th anniversary of Richard Nixon resigning as president of the United States. Do you remember where you were that day? Uh, I was but a mere twinkle in my parents' eyes. Ironically, as we we go on this topic, uh, my parents met, they were both television journalists, and they met covering the Watergate hearing. Really? So, uh, (laughs) (laughs) information is not quite gestation. (laughs) Okay, all right. It was a little before your time, but in a way very much a part of who you are when you think about it. Exactly, and I I remember... uh, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity at an event to interview Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. And I had to say to them, you know, thank you, because without you, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. The Academy recently realigned some of its executive structure as part of a plan to consolidate oversight in the planning and producing of the various daytime Emmy Awards program. What does that mean in terms of the ceremonies itself, Adam? What can you tell us about that? So I think uh, you'll you'll recall last year there there had been some questions raised about the administration of the Daytime Emmy Awards. And in response to those questions, I and our new chairman, who had both come fresh to the roles when these were raised, commissioned an independent investigation to take a top-to-bottom look at how we run our competitions, how we produce our shows, and identify areas where we can do better. And one of the recommendations that came out of that was to have a much clearer divide between those who oversee the administration of the competitions themselves and those who are producing the, the show. First and foremost, because there is a period of crunch time towards the end of the contest administration and the beginning of production planning for the show, where it just winds up being too much on one individual's plate, and indeed the investigation found that errors had been made in the past because there were too many things going on at that time. So rather than uh, our old model where we had had different uh, members of our leadership team focused on different genres, one for daytime, one for sports, and so on, but working on both sides of that coin, um, under this new model, the leads of each of our competitions will be focused squarely on the competitions themselves and not on the pre-production of the actual ceremony itself. And we are creating a new department of the Academy that will focus on on that piece. And so I think this is going to be a much more effective uh, allocation of our our resources and also help keep that mental bandwidth clear, if if you will. On the line with us is Adam Sharp. Adam Sharp, president of the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, the Daytime Emmy Awards. We'll take a quick time out, then we'll talk some more. With Adam Sharp, you're on TV Confidential. Hi, my name is Lily. My mom and dad used to fight about money all the time. Then one day, I heard them talking about this guy. Some uncle I never knew called Uncle Sam. Well, they say this Uncle Sam guy wanted them to pay him like a gazillion dollars. And they didn't have a gazillion dollars. So they called this company they heard on the radio called The Tax Doctor. And The Tax Doctor worked with Uncle Sam's people. I think they're called the IRS. And they're able to work it out so my mom and dad didn't have to pay Uncle Sam very much money at all. So now mom and dad are happy. And I'm happy too. Thanks, Tax Doctor. If you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS or state, call now and pay less. 800-649-0142. 800-649-0142. That's 800-649-0142. 
Story Salon is Los Angeles' longest-running storytelling venue. We have live shows every Wednesday in Studio City, as well as solo shows, podcasts, CDs, and several books. Los Angeles Daily News calls Story Salon Gemstones of Narrative, something new, funny, astonishing. Sunset Magazine says, Tales tall, tragic, and tantalizing. All of this makes Story Salon one of the most eclectic entertainment experiences available. You can learn more about us by going to our Facebook page or by visiting our website at www.storysalon.com. Accredited by Guinness World Records, welcome to Archival Television Audio Incorporated. A peerless TV soundtrack archive preserving the audio from television's first three decades, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the golden and silver age of television. For more information, go to atvaudio.com, become an advertiser or underwriter of TV Confidential, and let our brand help promote your brand. To find out more, go to televisionconfidential.com slash advertise. Ed Robertson, along with her friend Donna Allen Figueroa, who I understand has a new book out. Yes, it's entitled Fall Again Beginnings. It's the first part of a four-part contemporary romantic series uh, set against the background of working actors. Something that you know a, little, a thing or two well, about. Well, you write what you know, and I have been working in the business for several years. It is not necessarily autobiographical, but it's based on... Sure, many of the experiences that the actors in my book have, many have happened to me, many have happened to friends of mine. It's not, if you're looking for Valley of the Dolls, it's not, it's grounded in reality. It is grounded in reality, and it's the first in a series. Yes, called the Fall Again series. Fall Again. Which is available as a paperback as well as an ebook and in Kindle at fallagainseries.com. 